Dann beginnen wir mit deutscher Pünktlichkeit. Wunderbar. Wir wollen heute auch über German Games sprechen, über deutsche Spiele. Herzlich willkommen, dass Sie alle hier sind zu diesem Panel. Wie spielen Deutschland und die Welt in Zukunft? Und äh, ich führe heute Abend, heute Nachmittag durch die Diskussionsrunde. Ich darf Sie herzlich begrüßen, auch im Namen des Friedhelm Merz Verlages. Verlagsleiterin Dominique Metzler ist da, die Chefin, die Frau, die diese Messe jedes Jahr organisiert, jetzt im 36. Im 36. Mal. Kurz ein paar Worte zum Ablauf. Wir haben ein hochgerätig besetztes Panel äh, mit sechs fantastischen Gästen. Wir haben internationale Gäste gefunden und wir werden dieses Panel in englischer Sprache halten hier im Saal Berlin, damit äh, alle mitdiskutieren können und damit alle einander verstehen. So we will switch to English now and I would like to present you the guests and what we are talking about today because we are looking through this uh, This great um, window, which I compared to the Nautilus and the uh, underwater world of Captain Nemo once, and uh, we're looking on the universe of board gaming down there, and um, we're having 1,400 new games this year. Uh, the actual numbers for the German board game market alone are that we have uh, maybe 50 million copies sold this year at a turnaround of 500 million euros, and that is Germany alone. Worldwide, it's a lot more. It's a huge industry, and it's a thriving industry. There are growth numbers in uh, two-digit numbers, so we have 10, 15% plus for the next few years. So this is... Um, a sound fundament for uh, growth for companies and people like playing board games. People are able to buy board games because they are being produced. And um, we want to talk about how this will be in the future, what games are going to be produced, how they are going to be produced, how they're going to be marketed and um, how they will work on an international market. So would you please welcome the woman behind the success of uh, the stunning success of uh, Azul, um, Sophie Gravel from Plan B Games. <laughs> On the far side, we have a president from the USA. He's not the president, but he's the president of Stronghold Games, Stephen Bonacore. Poland, as we learn, is the emerging market in Europe with 48 uh, board game companies this year here in Essen. And uh, please welcome from, I think it's close to Katowice. Yes. And uh, from Poland and from Portal Games, Ignacy Cevicek. <laughs> Then it's always good to have several powerful women at your side. I, as a married man, know it. We have uh, one of the biggest and most powerful board game companies. We have from Asmodee Germany, Carol Rupp. <laughs> you may have recognized him by his green hair already. We, um, we failed to put him in a green chair, uh, as he would, would have wished for. But um, this is Friedemann Friese from Everlasting Funkenschlag fame. And last but not least, we brought from, um, is it, no, it's not Canada anymore, it's Seattle now, from Singapore, Singapore ma now, you're in Singapore, all right, uh, yeah, echt, but he's, uh, his grandmother is from like 10 kilometers away in Neuss, Eric M. Lange, the head of uh, game design at Cool Mini or not. So he's Canadian. He's Canadian, yes, but. She still stays close. <laughs> Sophie, we, we met at the Deutscher Spielepreis on, um, on Wednesday, yeah. and we awarded the Deutscher Spielepreis first place to Azul. It's, uh, it's, a, fantastic, it's a fantastic success. Do you, have, do you have any numbers? How many copies uh, did you sell already? Please, uh, take, please grab a microphone so everybody can hear you. Yeah, hello. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, Uh, yeah, Azul is a real uh, phenomenon, and it's not anything that uh, anybody can uh, forecast or can see coming. Uh, it really took us uh, by surprise. Um, we released the game last Essen, so it's a year old this week. Mm -hmm. um, before nomination uh, uh, in May, 
The game had already sold over 300,000 copies worldwide of the basic game, and this we made public. So the game really started and caught the attention of players and, and non-players and first-time players all around the world. Then came the nomination in May this year. Uh, it won in July, and uh, by now, as I uh, was saying, it's uh, a year old on the fair today, and uh, we have sold over 700,000 copies of the game. For me, I have been in this, well, Plan B is two years old, but I have been in this industry for a few years before, uh, under F2Z, and um, I had the privilege of uh, rebuilding or relaunching the pandemic line. And at the time we started with uh, pandemic, it was at uh, 40,000 copies. And that was uh, 2011, 2012 at the time. Uh, it sold about 40,000 copies in the world, which was already something quite successful. For quite huge, yes. For the time, yes. We relaunched a game, uh, we made some expansions, some standalones. Some of you might know Pandemic Legacy, uh, which was something uh, really different at the time. And by 2016, more or less, we were selling 700,000 copies, but of the whole brand, is that the whole lineup. Is that a success you can predict or you can control or you can... Um, you, you can be very thankful. But predict, no. <laughs> no, it's not something you can, you can hope for it, you can work for it, but at the end of the day, I think we can all say, I think we can all agree that we can do our best work uh, at developing the game with the designer, at making it the most, the best product we can. At the end of the day, it's these people that decide outside, the market decides if they think it's uh, we did our our job well, or if it pleases them, it's one, their decision. One of the growing markets in Europe it's uh, is Poland. You tell me that it's the third biggest market already in uh, in, in in Europe before before England. That is yes, correct. Uh, Poland is a very young market because uh, back then in the eighties, seventies, etc., there was, as you guys know, communism in Poland, and that means there was no board games. Per se, uh, so our market is very, uh, very young. Uh, when I was starting Porta Games Company, uh, basically there was no market at all. So it is like 15, 20 years ago, there was no board games uh, at all, no game companies, no designers. The market was growing, uh, but growing very rapidly. Uh, and uh, for some reason, I don't know what's the energy in the country, what's the energy in between these uh, young people. Somehow, all together, we managed to. Uh, grow this uh, industry in Poland uh, tremendously. And this is a uh, work of game stores, designers, publishers, distributors, like everybody was seeing potential, was seeing that there is nothing and we have to grow it. If you want to do what we love, that means board games. And there is, uh, you can literally find like this 10 or 15 people who are responsible for just building the whole market. And now after these 15 or 20 years, we have one of the biggest markets on the world, so uh, absolutely uh, amazing achievement of a uh, few crazy guys some time ago. <laughs> Carol, you, you just, this is a, a fairly new market, Poland, and I understand that uh, Double is being sold there already and uh, that you have um, Zug um Zug there, a ticket to ride it is, and um, you just went into a a completely new market or in another emerging market in Brazil. How do you how do you explore such a market? How do you find you take foot in such a market? Oh, it's not it's not me. It's um, my colleague from the international department, and he's selling first games to yeah other publishers, other distributors in those countries. And at one point they have a relationship, they discuss the market, how the market evolves, see how our games evolve on those markets. And for Brazil, it was uh, quite nice because they were also friends and they they really like to join the family. As we say, Asmode is a huge family. We really enjoy each other. We enjoy all the successes we do on the different markets together. And so seeing Brazil joining the family and already selling double in such high numbers, 
that's amazing. But you have to rely on local enthusiasts. You just oh, yes. don't, as a company, you don't say, well, that's a new market for our games. Let's just go there. But you have to rely on enthusiasts yep. you find there. So uh, Brazil is a fairly new country in gaming, let's say it this way. But uh, the guys running um, Galapagos, which is uh, the new company in Brazil, they uh, really are enthusiastic about games and they make the people game. So they do a lot of demo, which is exactly our DNA. We want to bring joy to the people. We want to see that uh, games are emotions and that people get emotional by playing games. So that's all about what we do. And that's exactly why we, we see um, how we can evolve new markets by bringing emotions to the people and make them realize that games is all about emotions. You're one of the top 10 board game companies worldwide with Asmodee. How in this, in this ranking, Friedemann, uh, where, where you ranked as a board game company with 2F Spieler? Um, this is difficult because I'm <laughs> distributing... Uh, in Germany, there is only the German games, but there are a lot of partners, bigger and smaller partners, uh, selling my games in other countries. So uh, Asmodee is selling my games in uh, Spain and uh, France because of the, um, the companies belonging to the Asmodee now, and Stronghold is selling the uh, newer games now. On the U.S. market. On the U.S. market. So it is very difficult to say where I stand because it's, uh, as a German company, I'm very, very small. But I have big partners. You have, but you have a distribution distribution with uh, Spiel Direct? Yes. It's yeah, yeah. a small distribution for, for smaller companies. Yeah, How is. good is that going? It's working very well and we are getting more and more companies together. And uh, it is, it's all about the... Uh, Small companies together uh, reaching one goal to be at the same place to uh, deliver the packages so that the um, retailers can uh, get the games on one address and get their games fast and with yeah very easy access and if you think uh, whatever retailer in the city needs games from ten different companies they have to yeah send ten different orders and it's better with this to be powerful together. So bending together, being powerful together, it's uh, what you call the Asmodee family. Um, Steven just merged uh, Stronghold Games. No, you didn't merge per se with indie cards and boards. Um, merge. What <laughs> merge. <laughs> sure. you merge. You created a new company, but you're standing individually like as Stronghold, as indie cards and boards. Yeah, so the, uh, what happened exactly was that uh, Travis and I have known each other for 10 years and uh, uh, grew up almost in the same rate. So it was just a good marriage of bringing two smaller companies together to create something that's actually substantial now at this point. Um, the brands are going to stand alone. Uh, they'll get uh, more differentiated brand identities, Stronghold Games, Indie Boards and Cards, and Action Phase Games, which um, Travis had bought two years ago. Uh, so we're going to get that, and we have an overarching uh, uh, company called Indie Game Studios. So there could be more companies that come into this at some point in the future. That's not a direct hint, but you know, there's uh, longer-term plans to continue to expand that. Because it, you minimize the risk for your for a single company. There's, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons we can. And Ignacy and I in our podcast, Board Games Insider, we talked about this uh, at length. There's all kinds of reasons why um, mergers and acquisitions make sense, especially in a, uh, uh, an industry where you, know, you, you need to compete for the mind share you know, of gamers. Uh, and the, the bigger you can get, the more eyeballs can be, uh, can be looked on that company as one company. We can now, for instance, also get a director of marketing, which we're, we've more or less hired one already. You can get specialized individuals within the company now because you have enough, enough sales and enough uh, product to make sure the person is able to push for you. We've expanded our development team, our production team. So we, you know, we've gone from only a few employees actually uh, in the middle of uh, this, this year to doubling the size of employees. 
Eric probably has uh, a whole com company unit for doing Kickstarters. Um, I imagine that several people may have posters of you in their in their rooms because uh, because these days, as a game designer, you can become a star. Uh, someone people look up to and say, "I want to be as famous as as him." He's just not um, as in older times, we didn't even get the name for game designers, but the, the designer is the star. How important is it for you to be um, internationally renowned? Must you have um, played his ego? It's, it's not <laughs> um, well, it's, I, it works every time. Honestly, I try very hard not to think about it that way at all. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a gamer. I love games. I've been playing games my whole life. Um, I'm doing what I love for a living. Um, and I... From just from my point of view, it's a uh, it's part of the job. I understand that it's it. Um, I have a style of uh, that. I have a style of game that I like. I have a style of game that I design, and I generally make games for myself. Um, so when uh, when they resonate with an audience, we have a connection in that way. So, um, and of course, I mean. I also have many designers that I look up to. So I understand the I understand the need for that. I just try not to. I tried to think about it in that, uh, in terms of, of fame or anything like that. And I mean, in terms of like, my hair is not nearly as cool as Friedman's, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> if, if, could you imagine green? Oh. But he's internationally renowned too. He and is. not only because of his hair, but uh, because uh, he's done Funkenschlag. And I think that that is uh, a strong fundament for the success of uh, 2F Spieler. Yeah. Yes, it is. But we are. Uh, Friday is doing a good and big job too now, and Favorite Fruit is coming uh, to that thing too. So there are other well selling games. So like there the are several games over whatever 50,000 copies sold. Like, like the fast forward titles uh, last year. and but. Uh, then you had three, three of them last year, yeah. and this year you have another one. Yeah, because it went well, and uh, Stephen just uh, said, "Hey, I forced him to do yeah. another one." <laughs> it was just like I showed him what what we were gonna do this year, and he was uh, where the uh, fast forward uh, follow up thing, and I said, "Oh, uh, oh. I have to design it." <laughs> And I did it, and uh, it worked out very well. So yeah, because there was an international demand on the U.S. market for that. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the concept, you know, with all of the games that are out there, and obviously, obviously, there's a glut of games in the market. I mean, it's just, it's, it's probably a topic we can talk about for quite some time. Uh, having a game where there are no rules in the box is a great concept. You open that game up, and it's a oversized deck of cards, tarot-sized, I call them. And then you flip a couple of cards, and it teaches you how to play the game. And then the game system changes over time, so you explore it. So non-destructive legacy. We, we've called it Fable System. Yeah. Trademark. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Did. Yeah. I, I did. It. Yeah, this started with a favorite food, which uh, yes. was starting, and, and then we, we added the fast-forward concept, just throwing away the rules, too. So. But this is language dependent, so it's necessary that you do um, an international version. You can't... You, the international version of Azul is... Uh, It's quite easy to do. You just uh, put in a leaflet with the German rules, the French rules, the whatever. Uh, the bag box. The bag box, um, yeah. But that is um, just a production thing. But if you have uh, like cards, yeah. um, how language dependent can international games be? Hmm. I think Eric can answer that better than I can. Well, you did uh, Pandemic Legacy. That uh, yeah well, yeah that's true. Well, the more language dependent a game is, the more difficult it makes it to have a, an international resonance. Because, um, the, well, just from the you need a partner to translate that. Because there are some languages you can do internally. So for ourselves, we do uh, French, English, and German with our team. We do that internally, but as soon as you we cross these borders, you need partners in Poland, you need partners in in, in Japan, and in, in all these territories. So, at the beginning, you need a partner. That makes it uh, one step. Um, then they have to be willing. They have to believe in the game, and they have to be willing to translate that and to bring it into their own market. 
That's the second uh, thing. From a pure publishing, manufacturing point of view, a language-dependent game make costs more to produce than an, a non uh, de a non-language dependent game because for example for Azul or for Reef or for any of these games you can produce the content in larger quantities uh, in one go and then you can just uh, you can add the rules and the back of the box as I said and adapt it to the to the individual markets which is an issue production cost uh, when you run a business uh, yeah, but the risk is uh, much smaller because those tiles, they will go into Korea or into the US, for example. Mm -hmm. It's the same, so you, you do make a risk for manufacturing the content, but it's a risk you can spread. Once you have printed those Korean games, if Korea doesn't take it, you have a problem. <laughs> so we try to, we work in, in a different way. But you could just open the boxes and put in a, um, a French leaflet and glue something over the backside of the box. Yeah, no, we but if you get a Korean, uh, yeah, a Korean fabled fruit, um, yeah. you're probably in, um, yeah. in troubled waters. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a different challenge. It's a, it's a different uh, business model. It's a, it's a different challenge. But uh, uh, we also do it both. For example, for the uh, Eggerspieler brand, these are um, most of all language-dependent uh, games. Or, and or they have... Uh, very important rules, 20 page uh, rules. So it's, a, it's also a different, uh, it's a yep. different beast. The, the, the point is that is, there is this disadvantage, but there's also the advantage because the people yes. from that country love to read their text on a card in their language. Okay. And they wanna have, they, they like to have a text on it and not a iconography, which is to, to be learned. Mm -hmm. Um, so like sometimes a lost expedition, maybe. Yeah, sometimes it is of course good. We try to make it as language independent as possible, but some some sometimes it is like people say, "Oh yeah, I have my language on the card, so it's really for me, and not." It feels like a more personalized copy of mm -hmm. the game than a big company thing. Uh, well, so yeah, I mean, we do, uh, uh, at CMON, we do very heavily language-dependent games. They're, they're big box games with uh, many, we call them exceptions-based games, where the core rules of the game are are about a half of the game, and all of the different components, the cards, the tokens, they add so much uh, variability of the rules that the exceptions are usually greater than the core. Um, we, on those text-heavy games, there's an additional challenge, of course, that um, uh, games are very uh, literally understood, right? And so the uh, translating them from one text to another, we also not only have to make sure that we translate uh, correctly, but with the, um, sometimes, especially in English games, we use a lot of idioms, right? Um, phrases that make sense in English and are very, very technically precise in English that may not be as technically precise in other languages or don't translate as well or require extra lines of text, which sometimes might change graphic design needs, that might change um, the size of a text box or the number of pages of rules needed. So it's, it's a greater consideration for us because we have to be a little bit more agile on the, when we design in English, right, um, the CMON the, the basic game is always designed in English, but we have to be a little bit flexible to understand that some languages will need more text and will uh, need a little bit less, and that adds some development time and a little bit of risk. Carol already nodded because she knows this issue from the Fantasy Flight games. Uh, oh, but also for uh, for Zemon, we are working yeah, with Zemon yeah, too. Um, I have to say, uh, your graphic layout and all the thoughts you spend on making your games adaptable in a different language is pretty good. So, uh, you. yes, you're referring to Fantasy Flight. They have a different approach of localizing a product. Mm -hmm. And there we s sometimes see, let's say this way, uh, that they really develop in English and think about English language and how long it is and how long it needs to be precise. And sometimes we, we need to go back to them and explain them, hey, guys, for, for us it's different. We Our language is also precise, but we need more words for it, or maybe we have longer words to, to put it, it, doesn't <laughs> put fit it on in the card, there. So, we have so it's have not two fitting cards. in that tiny space. Mm -hmm. Come, help us, because um, 
Zimon is providing files where we are able to adapt the graphic layout mm -hmm. if need be. Uh, FFG is providing files where we are working on a secured layer, and if we are going over that tiny box, then we have a problem. Mm -hmm. So and that's why we need to go back and forth until it fits. So when we're talking about localization, it's not only the translation of it, but it's adapting it for a local market for a certain um, kind of expectation what is in the game or um, a take on this game by the customers? Yes, I think uh, Eric also answered that a bit. So um, if you develop a game in a certain language, you exactly know what the people expect from a game and how they will read the phrase and understand the phrase. So if you transfer that to a different language, the, um, the understanding of uh, the same meaning could be different. Or um, if you take exactly the same words, they will take it in a different way. So it's not only translating, a pure translating process, it's really an adapting process to make it workable on your own market. Do you experience that that uh, some games do not work in certain markets, that you can only translate and localize so much, but it will never work on a certain market? That can happen. And <laughs> nobody I'm, can I'm tell you I'm why. Not sure if that, yeah, I'm not sure if that is a localization issue. I think that, that that's more of a pure marketing issue. Taste. Right? It's, taste. Yeah, it's, it's taste. It's a taste are, there, issue. are there differences in taste for say for Germany, for France, for the United States. You import a lot of games from Europe. You're, um, you're marketing European style games in the United States. And are there any boundaries where you say, or do you see yourself as an ambassador for European games on the US market? I think that um, over time, uh, it's, uh, those lines are blurring. They're, they're not as distinct. I mean, there was a time when uh, I think the American-style games just wouldn't sell really as much in Europe, certainly in Germany, but I think that that's blurring and definitely is in the other direction, too. We, we sell, obviously, a tremendous amount of German-style games in the U.S. There are hardcore gamers that want that kind of game, thinky game, serious game, in our market, and... Uh, I, I think sometimes we also think that themes, certain themes don't sell. But it's funny that now I, I see that that's, almost, that's blurring as well. Space-oriented games were always known not to, like, they, you can't do that in, in, in Germany and in some parts of Europe. And now, like, Terraforming Mars is a huge hit and uh, is selling great. And uh, so I think all of those things are blurring. I mean, there are certain, maybe resistance in, in a little bits of ways. But for the most part, gamers are gamers. They want good games. And they're buying all games that are good. But I, I see, I see different different approaches already on the uh, on the European market. When you have uh, German games, um, those are most most of them, or a lot of them, they are worker placement games. They are um, economic simulations uh, and all all kind of building stuff. And then you see um, the neighbors, the French. They have. Um, a <laughs> They have yes, the neighbors. Uh, they have a completely different approach uh, on what what a game should feature, um, graphic style, and um, I don't know a, a fun, a more f maybe a more fun approach because uh, it's not essential the, how the rules work. Um, I mean, Asmode is um, is part French, and you're you're in every country in Europe. Um, do you see? a difference in playing styles from country to country? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. I think every country is different. Every country has its own culture, and you can see that in the game, uh, in the game development, uh, also in how the games are played. So I have a very old example of my first days at Asmodee when I joined them back in 2012. Um, so that time I, we received a game and there was, yeah, it was a very nice st a strategy game. But when I re read the rules, it was, okay, so in which order do I take these steps? Because I have functions that allow me to do this or that before that or this. So the Germans will take it Ah, that will not work because you have to be precise. So which order is it correctly? Please give it to me. And the French people are more like, okay, 
So we solve it our way. Uh, we do it this way, and the next table is doing it that way. So yeah, you really see that the cultures and the culture of gaming is different from country to country. How is it, uh, in Poland, Ignacy? Are they, uh, how are they different in their approach? Yeah, I think uh, in Poland uh, we play and respect the heavy games. And I remember my first time I, I went to Bruno Fajdutis, Gathering of Friends convention in France. It was my first French convention. And there was no Agricola or Puerto Rico. There was party games, no wine, and everybody was smiled, and they were relaxed, and they were having fun. Mm -hmm. It was so different than our conventions. <laughs> Uh, and then I learned that in, in each country, when I started traveling around the world to different conventions, uh, is exactly as, as it was said, uh, players are different. In America, for example, um, when we were demoing Detective uh, this year, um, in Poland, when I was playtesting the game, the average uh, game took like two hours. In America, four hours, because they have a time to discuss and to buy a call in the meantime and walk away and start again. And I was like, oh my God, for our game. Uh, so each country plays a little bit different. Uh, we are probably looking for something else from the game. So on one hand, we as the publishers are providing one piece of cardboard. And then in different houses and in different countries, it is a little bit different experience. It hits different markets. Yep. And then you have to see what something people... Different like happen. in Singapore... Um, I don't know. If you, you go to a game cafe in Singapore, what oh, is yeah. being played there? Well, so Singapore is interesting. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to speak from a position of expertise. I've only lived there for a year and a half. Um, but I do spend a lot of time at game stores and at game cafes. Uh, I find in Singapore, it's, um, uh, I'm, I'll call it big city Asia, which is a, probably far too broad, but I'll use it anyway. Um, they're, they, they, um, they're, it's a little bit uh, polarized. They will either play uh, like very, very, very light social games, silly games like par uh, Cards Against Humanity, and they have a hundred games like that, um, or uh, really heavy economic engine two hour plus zero games. Not a lot in between. Uh, so you don't, uh, there's not quite as much variety there. And, and now part of that is because the gaming scene there is not, uh, is not very well developed. Um, there, there, are not as, there are not a ton of different diverse groups playing a bit ton of different diverse games together in the same space. So it's po quite possible that what people are playing at home is very diverse, but in public spaces it's not quite as much. Because uh, I think in Japan... Everybody who's uh, living in a very confined space in their apartments, there is a tendency to have small games and to have the, the bigger games in, uh, in like a cafe or in a board game club where the, there's more storage plays. So the living conditions, they uh, tell you how to produce a game in in different countries? Is that true? Is that your experience as a, as a company? Well, we didn't sell too many Pandemic Legacy in Japan. <laughs> 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 so that might indicate that. But it is, it, is a matter, it is a matter of space, of course. It has small boxes, but it's, yes, it's got a lot look, of small boxes. And if you look, for example, at, a, at a, a publisher that comes here every year called Japan Brand, they come with a whole lot of different games from different um, designers and they all bring these little card games and they're all in very small formats and you understand that it, that it, it is a limit to their market and so that's how they, 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 they develop or they think uh, about games. Um, it is true, I, well it is my personal um, opinion that um, uh, localization it's beyond localization but that culture um, uh, influences uh, game design much um, we you were referring to uh, f the difference between the, the French culture and Ignacy was saying it always included wine and a bit of chit chat and it is well, true so. <laughs> no but it it's very true if you I th it is my, yeah if you look if you tend toward to more towards the Latin uh, countries, mm -hmm. France, Spain, Italy, French Canada, which I'm from, um, uh, playing a game is a, is a moment. It's a, you, you, create a, you create a moment and it's, a, it's more about the, um, 
the experience of the play. It's more about the fun you sh you spend and the, the the exchange with the other people and the, the wine and the, all of this. And if you go, for example, in Germany, this is my own personal observation, it's more of an intellectual challenge that they appreciate. The more of the, hmm, this is this, and I have to solve that. And if I go here, I get that, which is a different type of pleasure. But it's... Uh, it's uh, on different uh, spec. You can appreciate both, but I think it's very much um, it's very much influenced by culture. Uh, in Germany, I, I found that uh, it's an it's a image I have in my head, but it's it's a true one I saw. I was once in a breakfast uh, hot, uh, room in a hotel, and there were three little bowls, and all bowls had eggs. One had a sign, it said two minutes, the other one four minutes, and the other one eight minutes. You want to know what you get? In, in, in France, we just want an egg. <laughs> but it is true. But it's maybe scrambled, or it's uh, sunny side up. It can be, then you can be a bit more creative, but we just want an egg. Yeah. And, but Sophie... And Sophie, this is true, and I, I find it's beautiful. First time I went to the American breakfast, yeah. ordering my breakfast, it was just like so many questions about the condition of my eggs <laughs> to be delivered. <laughs> it is sunny side up, blah, blah, blah. It was just like, uh, eggs. Yeah. <laughs> and I was not accustomed to all these words, and they are just coming into my mind. It was just like sorting them out and trying to find out which one is the one I wanted to order because they are I'm absolutely not known to all these <laughs> phrases because no one in school teached me the different ways to <laughs> create breakfast. <laughs> Just learn scrambled eggs. Oh, yeah, yeah. You'll, get, you'll get through American breakfast very easy though. <laughs> scrambled eggs. Um, there's actually, there's one non, uh, I mean, there, uh, what everybody's talking about, are there different factors, right? And of course, there's not just one factor that influences a, a, um, a game, uh, and they're all right, but there's one, that's, there's one I've found that's actually very non-obvious, uh, which is climate. Um, the, the climate of a, a country, I've found, at least through observation, does affect a little bit uh, how serious or how intellectual a game can be. Like, I mean, you, go to, you go to the south of Spain or the south of Italy, where the weather's great, and you just want to go outside and swim in the ocean all day, you're not going to play or sell as many like like Twilight Imperium or Blood Rage games there that people play inside for 12 hours. Uh -huh. where the Which weather would probably is not fit into a Tokyo flat either. Well, yeah. <laughs> but but you interesting part is uh, that you say the weather is great. The greatest weather for me is rain because everybody wants to play inside. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you just use the word great weather. For board gamers, there is a special great weather. It is now we have here... Why is the fair in this area now? It's windy and cold outside. <laughs> yeah, because we can't play games inside here. And you're right with the climate. Yeah, because here in, in Germany, we are in the, in the best climate for gaming. It's not as dark in, as, as in Finland or something. You're not so depressed by the weather. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the and game can not see so you, up you get any not, time. And you don't need the siesta of the, of the southern parts. Yeah, so you can really do that. And we had the, the luck to find a lot of resources in our, uh, our area to, to get uh, an industrialized nation, so we have spare time. To, to, so it started in Germany, on my, my opinion, on that reason. That was the most German answer <laughs> ever heard. But it makes sense from start to finish. <laughs> of course. It's very exact. <laughs> I, I, I think there was a, a, a review of Funkenschlag uh, a while ago on Shut Up and Sit Down. It's an, uh, an English-Canadian uh, video blog. And they said, this is, in its preciseness, uh, it's a very German game. And it comes with all sorts of, uh, of wooden cubes. And, um, and you love wooden cubes, do you? <laughs> It's okay, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Would you, I mean, I'm, would, I'm not not much for the miniatures. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you: How, how do you like um, a box that size, crammed full of uh, miniatures and all in plastic? Or it was just like I I, I played Max vs. Minions, and which, which I liked, which I always thought it is uh, 100. It, it is. It, it should be 80 percent of that because I think it's too big. Mm -hmm. Because I cannot overview the whole part. For me, it's too big. 
I sit there and think. Says the man who is doing a game with 504 possibilities. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. This, haha, <laughs> there are wooden cubes and you can. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was interesting. But I sat there and said, oh, nice. It's very good. The miniature is awesome. But it feels like a bit too big. If you see a game uh, in an abstraction with wooden cubes, Eric, do you. I mean, it gives me a, it gives me an indication of what the game experience will be like. Yes, uh, I mean that. I mean, right, wrong, or indifferent, right? If I, um, I will say this. Of course, this is my prejudice, right? And uh, and I am to be clear. I am. Uh, I was raised German, so I have a bit of German background myself. But the um, if I were to go to a fair and I would see a game with a board that has many sections and a lot of different cubes of different colors and some dice arranged in a particular uh, pattern. Everybody has a little player board and there's a score track around it. I am inclined to believe it will be a very thinky game about converting some of those cubes into some of those other cubes. And there'll be a very clever mechanism for rolling those dice, but then figuring out how to combine them in very specific different ways, maybe 504 different ways. <laughs> um, and um, and that's, that's fine. That, um, for me personally, just for my taste, um, that to me that feels a lot like work. Um, and that's because I design games for a living. Uh, if I didn't, I would probably enjoy that a lot more. This is my, my pro, it's very interesting because uh, I don't want to, I don't understand this here because if I see something like that, I'm out too because I'm not much into point salad. Yeah? So I try to make games without point salad. Yeah, I know a lot of people like these stuff, and when I see these little player boards and these little tiny actions, a lot of actions, I have still that feeling that it will not be a game for me. I, I, my theory is that the in gamer, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, in our, especially in the the, the more um, developed part of our community, uh -huh. there is a desire to design games. Like if you talk to any sample of random ten gamers, I would say two to three of them are thinking about a game design of their own or would like to design a game. They're having a favorite and game and maybe three favorite games, and they want to do an amalgam of them for an own. Game. Absolutely, or, or they have a brand new idea, right? But the thing, but playing those kind of games that that strip away the immersion um, and focus you purely on the the puzzle. Um, it it's exercises the very, very same, uh, the, the, the same part of the brain that designing a prototype it is. So like often when I play a game like this, I will not name any names, but I played many of these games where it's like I, when, I, when it was done, I felt like I should have a prototype at the end of it, and I, was, I felt like I, sh I should have been paid for this. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's personally because I do this every day, and it, it exercises the exact same skill set. So I prefer games that are a little bit more immersive and a little bit more... A little bit more air in the design. Steven, That's personal taste. Stephen, when you, when your director of marketing yet to be uh, announced, um, when he has got uh, a cube European style game or German game, and you want to sell it in the US, where they are, uh, the heavyweight is uh, the miniature heavy game with uh, more storytelling, or something like that. Uh, how do you, how do you market that? That's what they're going to tell me how to do when they get on board. All right, it's because you're high, I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, so it, it's um, you know, we're we're just known for you know the style of games, uh, you know, that are from the European market. So it's it's not it's our fans are coming to me not for the Simon big miniatures production, which I love personally. That's, I love Eric's games. I really do. No matter how much I tease him, I love his games. Um, but. Um, for me to sell those kind of games into uh, to the North American market is is not difficult at all. Um, we we show on the box that this is going to be a big game by usually by some really well known designers. In a lot of cases, we've got a big Feld game coming out for them, Trey Johnum. Again, that's coming from here though. But uh, to sell them into the U.S. market these days is is simple for us. You said that they, um, you mentioned earlier that the, the lines are blurring between different styles, between different countries. Um, I think it's maybe based on the fact that you can distribute a game everywhere in the world and that you have new possibilities of uh, marketing a game um, and of producing it via Kickstarter. Eric uh, knows Kickstarter very well. He's, uh, I think, uh, Blood Rage was the first Kickstarter to to hit the one million dollar mark. Um, uh, Zombicide was actually Zombicide season two, Some, but like, but, right. but uh, Blood Rage was the first that I designed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and Rising so, Sun just went through the roof. Uh, it was pretty big, yeah. Um, the 
So Kickstarter is interesting in in many many different ways, and we could talk about this for hours. But the the um, Kickstarter is a little bit, to my mind, uh, is an outlet for both. Uh, on the one side, for independent creators who are not uh, enfranchised in the in our system of distribution and retail, to um, test their creative to, to their creative acumen and go like, here, I have this great game idea. I'd like to test it at the market and see if it will fund. On the other side, for companies, established companies like Simon uh, and Monolith and stuff like that, is uh, they are like a marketing event. They're still useful because. Uh, as uh, as these guys have said, there are many, many, many games on the market, and to do a triple A release, like as we call them, uh, we actually use Kickstarter to um, have this big, like, thirty day interactive marketing event with our fans, uh, because we really like to involve them and make them feel like they're a part of the journey. Um, if uh, I don't know how many of you guys follow Kickstarter campaigns, but it uh, it it really feels like that. And we, by the way, just to be clear, we're um, Sometimes it seems like everything is pre-planned and we know exactly what's going to happen. And that, to a degree, that's true, but we, uh, we leave room in, all, in our Kickstarters. I know other publishers do too. Nobody knows exactly how it's going to end um, because we leave room to be agile um, and to react to the fans. It's a great platform for that. Uh, it is almost like doing a big public beta test, with, um, except we get to fix it before it comes out uh, on the market. Because you know beforehand how many customers you can envisage. Well, and we also get to, um, like, we, we test our games very, very carefully, but uh, we know that when we launch a Kickstarter, we have a game that we feel is ready to publish, but um, we put a little room in there to make sure that uh, maybe we misguessed uh, some of our marketing decisions, right? Maybe maybe some of the people would prefer um, this, like maybe there's too many miniatures in the box, or they prefer this character over this one, or they, they maybe want to rename something. Like, we can do stuff like that. And that, that type of agility is only possible on a, on a platform like that, where we can be reactive and be... Um, And responsive, and I mean, it's a lot of work for us, right? We do have staff that are full time doing that, uh, but I, I believe it does, it does help uh, define our identity to a point. Kickstarter has become a global marketing event. When you get a game and it works, you know, well in a Kickstarter environment, it, it, it is big, big for marketing, and and Simon has proven that certainly very, very clearly. Stronghold has done one Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Just a lot and all the others, but you're on it, none, none, none. Ignacy, would you? I did. I did only for some special projects, like my books, for example. We will have some kickstarters in the future, but only for the very special, unique projects that don't match our regular line of games. None, no. no. And as for the, I, I don't. Not yet. If if you don't mind, so Frank. Far, no. Yeah, sure. Just yeah. So so, but indie boards and cards which is now part of the merged company, has, have done 40 very successful Kickstarters. So, so there'll be more in Stronghold Games. So uh, through the merger, you are go, you're getting the expertise to do... It's, it's another part of the merger. Mm -hmm. is to bring, it's a talent play as well, and to bring an expertise that was already existing there to both companies. So we will be doing them for certain projects, not the ones that come over for like from Friedemann, uh, but for in-house developed games, which we do do as well, We'll be definitely back on Kickstarter because of the amount of marketing that it uh, that it does it does provide. And it's a fairly accessible, easy way to market your games. Can you can you be without it in the future? Can companies be without it? I think quite a few companies can be without it. Um, some of them very 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 successful. We uh, could, but it, uh, but at this point, why? Right? It's it's a really good. It's it's not for everything. It's not for every. Like, there are many successful publishers, right, that don't use Kickstarter at all, and it's not for everybody. But for particular types of games, especially like some of the Simon style games, um, as long as we don't oversaturate, do too many, it it is a really good way to a cut through the noise and b to uh, present ourselves at our best to as large an audience. As large a primed audience as possible, right? People come to Kickstarter with expectations. Um, so, uh, unlike you know the, the the big open global market, that they know what they're getting into with this, and they're in for they're in it for a wild ride, and we're going to give them that. So, probably not every game is uh, suited for Kickstarter. If I think about, I don't know, the next Azul thing, or the next Centuries Three, um, what stretch goals would you would you find? 
we would never use uh, Kickstarter for projects like this. It could be, for example, something uh, we could have used in the past. Uh, we referred to uh, Pandemic Legacy uh, shortly back. Um, it is something we could have, but it's a um, personal uh, uh, vision for th the reason why we don't. Do you want to remain in control over the project? Uh, it's not that. I think there's, as uh, Eric says, I think that there are specific games that are right for a Kickstarter uh, project. I also see it as a great marketing tool. I, I witnessed that. I think there are two t uh, Kickstarter projects sh should be considered, or I see them in two different, um, uh, different uh, not styles, but there's the Kickstarters that are Kickstarted by publishers. That's mm -hmm. one Kickstarter. And there are all the Kickstarters that are done by individual uh, game designers mm -hmm. who use Kickstarter to promote their games. Um, Eric said Kickstarter cuts through the noise. I consider it, it creates noise. Because um, especially from the projects that are Kickstarted directly from, from uh, game designers or self-publishing, because they didn't go, these games did not go through the process of uh, being presented to game editors, selected, considered is this a good game or not, and they come out into the market anyway. And I think that in the, the situation today, you said we are, there are 1,400 games yes. uh, released. This, is, um, this uh, adds on top. And it creates a lot of, uh, of releases. And it's becoming more difficult for anybody through Kickstarter or standard publishing companies to come out and, and, and uh, go out of the noise or break the, to be heard. On the other hand, um, there is Kickstarter, there is social media. Yeah. And you have, um, you have 1,400 new games that create, that, that won the, the game's attention. How do you create that attention? I mean, uh, Ignazi, he's, uh, when he's not on the panel, he's constantly on social media um, because he's doing, uh, he's doing Facebook Lives and he's, um, he's chatting with his customers and he's presenting insights into his work. Um, how essential is that for you? Yes, uh, our company is especially in that way that uh, we are from Poland, but our big market is in America. So the only way to communicate with the customer is uh, using blessing of the internet. Uh, I am not able to be at the conventions on a regular basis in America. I am not able to visit game stores in America to do some launch events. And the only way is to use Facebook Live, uh, to use vlogs, to use Twitter, Snapchat, and all these tools. And... Um, so it works for us very well. We we established a, a nice nice company in America, and we are doing very well. And it is all, all because of this uh, one phone, basically uh, being used smart. Uh, so yes, of course, this is uh, super super important. And um, communicating with the customers on the basis that we do, like doing vlogs, doing some game designer journals, doing like really a lot of content, how the game is developed and how it is. Uh, designed, when the game is finally there, those people were watching me designing this game for the past few months, and they cannot wait to get this game. So we have a great opening, I would say, uh, for each game we do, because our hardcore fans, our ultra fans, are watching me and my team developing these games for six, seven months, and then we say, we're just starting pre-orders, mm -hmm. and they are waiting for that moment. So it helps a lot, and then, of course, the game has to prove that it is interesting, good, and then they will, they will talk about this game. So we are creating an evangelist for our brand, uh, people who love the brand, who love the, the games, and they will talk about the things that I share. For them, is a very interesting peek into the industry, actually. They w watch using these social media photos, vlogs, lives. They watch people working in the board game company. They watch us the, testing games, uh, developing, changing artwork. They saw, they see sketches, like all that kind of stuff. Very interesting for hardcore fans. But you are um, creating a hype for your games. You're uh, raising the expectation. And uh, if I may say, in the case of First Martians, the hype went stronger than uh, the reviews. Yeah, the hype went out of the control. Let's, let's, let's call it that way. Uh, because you, you couldn't control it any longer because it was out of the box? 
and uh, we don't actually know what happened like uh, we we sent few a few messages about the game and then it went viral and since then i remember precisely when i was coming from a gamma trade show in march uh, from America and I came back to Poland to office and, and I said we are screwed like I, I I knew how many retailers visit our booth with this expectation they have so many pre-orders everybody's talking about the game and I said we will never meet these expectations like it was impossible to do that and since then you can it is very interesting research if you have some time uh, since March last year I was giving interviews to different media and in every single interview, I was using phrase, it is just boring Euro game. You can literally, <laughs> you, you can literally hear me in every single interview. I was just try, trying to call down, call down the, the hymen of saying, this is a Euro game, this is a just boring Euro game, don't get you to be ex uh, too excited. Uh, everybody was thinking that I'm making a joke. Uh, so actually, the hype was growing. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they made the game a realist, uh, and besides uh, some problems in the game, uh, mm, we were never able to, to meet expectations. And uh, of course, uh, on one hand, we had uh, mm, fans who loved the game, and we have a ton, and once again, for somebody who is uh, doing some research, a very fascinating story, uh, a ton of people who just bought the game because they heard it is good. They had no clue, who am I, what kind of games I'm doing. They had no clue the, the, about all the developer diaries I was putting. I was reading science books in English, that's really cut. Chemistry in English, physics, like this was a science game, and it was from the very beginning. But all these people just heard, first machine is good, and they just bought the game, and then they learned that this is like a biology in school. And and I was treating it very seriously. And then you and got the were, first reviews and they weren't turned not yeah, out to be because, yeah, they, they expected, I don't know what, <laughs> but they expected some uh, funny, crazy game about, I don't know what, actually. And they get the super serious science game. And they said, bah. <laughs> uh, and it didn't help with the cells. And how, how, how essential is it that you get reviews in your favor in the, in the first first days and weeks when the game is out as, uh, as a company, Kara? Is oh, it's really important to have the right reviews at the right time. Yeah, If it's directly at the start, sometimes, yes, probably most of the times, but not always. So um, it's also very essential to find the right timing to release a game. So right now, we, we all heard it, it's 1,400 games releasing here, or a novelty here. So how to get out of all that noise, how to be over that noise, be bigger than that noise, and that's the challenge. It's not always easy to do that. You can fail at it every two or three times. So we, we try to find the right way for it. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. We, we are all human beings. You don't know how the people react to what you do. You have an idea of how they can react to it. And most of the time it works, but you, you cannot be sure about it. And so it's always a miracle when it happens. And pandemic, uh, Sophie created the game with her company. And then it was, uh, her company was sold to Asmodee and we took over. And we all agreed that this is one of the most exciting concepts we ever saw. And so we tried to make it happen. And it happened. So everybody was talking about pandemic legacy. And that was a huge success for marketing, for getting out of the noise, being the noise, mm -hmm. to be precise. Yeah. But you cannot deliver that each and every day. But as, um, as a big company, you can probably rely on the background of the company and you have um, the possibility to fail with a new game. Like when you try out a unique game now, the, the yep. concept of Discover, and you don't know what you get. It can be uh, an instant hit. It can be uh, a failure, maybe, sure. and um, which would be devastating for a small company. But for an international company, it's uh, probably say, all right, we shift numbers a bit. 
I mean, that's um, the good point of being such a gr large group now. So we can do trial and error. And honestly, we have to do that trial and error thing. So we have to be innovative, we have to be creative, and we want to be that. And we want to drive the market by that, but not everything that is creative and innovative will succeed in the end. So take a risk, that's it. Have a unique game concept, how we call it, yeah, that's wonderful. And by now, or so far, I can tell you, Discover works. I'm happy about that, <laughs> but yeah, so it will be good in the end. Um, but we all worked for that day to make it happen. And we were fighting, really fighting with, um, with the different ideas of how to make it happen because again, we are back to cultural differences and also on how to market a game. So we wanted to do it different than the US and even the Asian guys wanted to do it differently because they said, yeah, but our market needs it uh, to be presented in that way and we need to talk about it in that way. We said, yeah, no, but we don't want to show too many different pieces of the game because we want to... <laughs> Have the people, hey, wow, what's that? And what are they talking about? And the Americans were, yeah, but we need to explain the mechanisms because otherwise the American market will not buy the game. We said, okay, how to make that happen? Uh, we have three different concepts and we have to merge And you have them one. parallel? You, you're oh, yeah. doing them parallel or do you, do, do you merge these three oh, we, we different approaches? We found approaches. a good common ground. Uh, Robin would be able to talk more about it because he was one of the concept inventors then. Um, but yeah, we, we made it happen and in the end it works. So Discover so far is well received here. So we learned there is a lot of noise and um, that the lines are blurring between games. So uh, there is an international competition for the games market and for the attention of gamers. And more games means, means less attention span per game. So what kind of game does that produce as a company, as an author? Do we get smaller games that are easy to play, fast and then forgotten? Or <laughs> do we... Uh, replayed. Or replayed? Or do we get classics that that have a, a, whole, a whole world they create where you can stay in? Or do we create lines like Azul? Azul Sintra, Azul 3 maybe, Azul the card game, I don't know. I think there's a, there's a niche for all of these categories you mentioned. It's just that you have to be uh, within the pole position of all of these categories. So there is a market for short, easy uh, games that you replay. Uh, there is a market for longer games, for gamers' games, for the three-hour game. There is a market for all of these, even if there are 1,400 games uh, coming out there. But um, uh, out of the 1,400, how many will still be sold next year? And that is, the, that is becoming the issue. Not all of these 1,400 will be still sold next year. And so it's, um, and it's a very small, unfortunately, it's a very small proportion of that. If you look at, you just look at one or two essence ago, mm -hmm. what is still uh, sold, what is still marketed, what is still played by the, the people. So I think there is, a, there is a, a, a niche, and there is a market for all of these, but as publishers, we have to make sure that if we attend this uh, market segment, we have to come out in the top positions, otherwise we are. Um, sunk. <laughs> sure, Eric. I mean, um, so I, I um, there's a, there's a lot of what uh, that, uh, what Sophie does with Plan B that I really respect, and we we follow this uh, philosophically too. Is that um, internally we talk about right? We talk about the market, how big it is, is 1,400 games and stuff like that, and it's an interesting philosophical exercise to think about like how we adjust games and stuff, but um, practically speaking, we don't really pay that much attention to it. We don't try to design to a particular market trend right now or, or to where we think uh, uh, the factors we can't control. At the end of the day, you have to 
we just have to put all of our resources and all our love into every game that we do and do and and have the discipline to not do as many as we'd like to right every every publisher including us i mean we have we have ideas for 100 we could do 100 games a year if we just if we printed everything we wanted to um and we still do simon does do quite a few games we're get doing less and less every year but the idea is we just want to if we release a game we'll put everything into it and let the market decide and we want to because we want to build a reputation for um when when you see our logo on a box that you know we put everything into it and uh we will we'll leverage that trust right and just stay unwavering from it um at some factors and how we design games will be affected by what we call the meta market but not that much honestly like we're not i'm not thinking about like oh no if they're going to be 1800 games next year maybe we shouldn't do a game like this we're like no this game is awesome our staff loves it our players love it we're going to release it but why would you produce less games each and every year uh that's so that's resources thing right um we could produce 100 games we'd have to have a gigantic staff of thousands to do the same level of quality that we do now and uh as exactly as sophie said the failure rate of of um of games over time would mean that our batting average would just go down. Um we generally like to uh, our batting average is pretty high, right? For how many games succeed over uh, uh, greater than the first three month uh sales cycle. We do that because we're we're concentrating a little bit more and we're not competing with ourselves. Right? If if we release 50 games in a year, there's even a point where fans of uh, of our company are just not going to have the dollars to spend or the attention to spend on each one. But you're competing. You're competing for for shelf space. There's only so much uh, space. At, I don't know. Are you at Walmart? You're at Walmart. You, you do it in Canada. Uh, We are at Barnes and Noble. It's not at Walmart. No. So uh, you want to be you want to be on the top shops. You want to be at Karstadt, don't you? No, I don't want to be there. <laughs> yes. um, the question is. Uh, um, <laughs> It is okay that you talk all about this, yeah. Everybody said a company has to grow or it dies or something like that. The truth is I have a family, two kids, I can feed them. And I can spend my complete time on designing games. And then I have a great colleague in Henning and doing all the other stuff. And whenever we grow, I have to do some work I don't want to do. I have to go to social media, I have to go to whatever, I have to contact fans, have contact with them rapidly, mm -hmm. which totally distracts me from designing games. <laughs> yeah? So I'm very happy guy to be in that position. Yeah? So I sit there, I can do my living, and I don't want to grow. So I don't, if I have to go to Karstadt, whatever this means, I have to sign in contracts, I have to talk about people, only talking about percentages, only talking about markets, not talking about the quality of the games, the fun of the games. They're only talking about products, not about games. I don't want to do that. Because that is what is at the heart of it. It is not my style. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is um, games are part of pop culture, but you don't want to be a pop star. I'm a pop star here for four days a year. This is more than enough. It's fine. <laughs> I would like to discuss the last aspect of this uh, because. Um, The games have to be written and, and designed, and um, at last some have to be sold then uh, in the end to feed a family or to feed a company. Um, in between, they have to be produced. Um, with ever more games being produced, do you see that there is um, a shortage in, in, uh, in production possibilities and production uh, capacities worldwide? Nothing. Um, we are not because we have a lot of uh, yes, we have a lot of Polish. Uh, yes, this is companies. the second day of the third, so I'm already after a few meetings with the manufacturers, mm -hmm. and uh, almost everybody is uh, telling us here at the show that they are just buying new machines and buying new stuff because the demand from the publishers is 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 huge, the market is is growing, and of course we can debate about overcrowd in the market because too many games, but. Even if there's a 
not growing number of titles, the print runs are bigger. Like uh, what, what we are printing right now is much more than we were printing back then. And I'm talking not about the only portal games, but the whole industry. The print runs are bigger. So yes, there is uh, the feedback from the manufacturers. At least the portal games we get is that yes, we know we should do it faster, and yes, we are improving. Because um, I think Discover it arrived Wednesday at noon on the fair. Yep, but not because it arrived from the pa uh, factory that late, because the truck was late. All right. Simple reason. Simple reason. And each and every Kickstarter I see, they are late. There, there's always some some issue with the production facility in China, and uh, then it's. There's a Chinese New Year, and they can't print because everybody, everybody's off for three weeks. And so this game will arrive later. Well, w nowadays we factor that all in. We just assume everything's going to be late all the time, that every truck is going <laughs> to catch fire, that a plane's going to like fly into the ocean. Like just, We just assume that at this point. Um, and we just build that into our schedule. We just Now we're just focused on... Our game is going to be, uh, we're taking a little bit of an attitude of it's done when it's done. And we're telling people that even after a Kickstarter is finished, we still develop a game for months. Um, because like, it's not like we can just change a bunch of stuff on the Kickstarter and like, oh, let's package it, right? That, that we have to, there's a ripple effect on the game. We have, to, um, we have to make sure that it's like perfect before it goes out. That takes a lot of time. Um, and we're communicating that pretty openly, right? It's, Uh, this game's going to be a year late after the Kickstarter. And it seems weird, right? You're like, but but you got your money and you, you showed us your miniatures, it's done. It's not, right? We showed you what was done and before we made changes. Now we have to do a lot of work still. Um, so I think, I think we've, in the last five or six Kickstarters we did, I think we've actually delivered early before our uh, projected delivery date. But because we project out really far, we just don't want to, Uh, we don't want to overpromise anymore. So, if we come to an end of this discussion, and the question was, how will Germany and the world play in future? And I would like to start with you, Stephen. How will we play in future? Yeah. How will Germany play in the future, or how will we all play in the future? You tell me. <laughs> we are going to continue to play a lot of games. And um, the, mark, the one great thing, you know, 1,400 games, of course, uh, coming out at one moment in time, the, the reason that it, it can even possibly happen is because of everybody sitting out here who are out there evangelizing the fact that board gaming is just where it is at right now. And my philosophy about why this has been growing like this and why we're doing more and more of this is because of what Eric saw me doing like right before this started. I was on the phone and I was <laughs> doing something. And we're so disconnected from one another um, over, over digital space. Uh, we get together as social beings and we sit around the table hopefully with a glass of beer or wine, and we enjoy each other's company, and we compete, we co cooperate, and all of you are helping us bring that mindset out to the rest of the world, and thank you all for helping us. I think we're going to do more and more gaming in the future. Eric, will I be printing, in five years, will I be printing miniatures for a Simon game on my 3D printer? Uh, probably. <laughs> I, 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 honestly, I don't know. Um, I'm pretty focused on just making fun games. Um, uh, as far as what, like, what we're going to be doing, I mean, uh, play is essential to being human, right? Uh, there will, that will never change. So form factor might change, medium might change, but we are always, there's something, there's fun, something fundamental about, create, yeah, about play and within a constricted set of rules, and the more social, the better. Um, and I think, like, I think everybody here is going to be along for that ride for, for good, right? You may, you may get distracted for a little while. You may, you may become teenagers and go play, go girls and, uh, and, and, uh, and fast cars and stuff like that. But you're going to come back to games, like always. Like, you'll never be able to take the uh, game, game out of the gamer. I truly believe that. And Asmodee is going to be there for you. They When better. <laughs> oh, we will. <laughs> <laughs> They're one of our for every, for every boy and girl like who wants his game. So yeah, 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 sure, I know. 
And but we are all gamers. Um, I think the two already said, we are all human beings, we are social beings. So gaming is just one of our core DNA for us as a human being. So we play, we are, we, we like to enjoy each other, we like to interact. So yes, there will be games in the future, whatever kind of games that is, because we are all different. So there are people that enjoy party games, fast games. There are people that really like to uh, see how the wooden cube evolves from that part of the board to that part. But And there are a lot of people like miniatures, done by Eric. Um, yeah, but anyway, we, we like to, to entertain each other, to see how we react to a game or the emotions that the others show. So yes, there will be games in the future and we will love it. What games may you possibly design in the tranquility of, uh, of Bremen? of your house on uh, 361 days <laughs> of the year. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go forward. I, I still like the fact that you can take whatever, 60 cards or something, some cardboard or some miniatures or wooden pieces and create something new out of it. And yes, of course, the virtual reality or the computer games, there, is more, there are less limits of what you can do. But I like these limits. I have only 60 cards. I have these fast-forward concept, only 90 cards to create a game of, out of it. This is a challenge for me as a designer, and this is also people like. You sit around, and somebody is grabbing out whatever pack of cards, and you play. Yeah? Yeah? And the people go there, and uh, years ago, a lot of people said, oh, the computer game industry is growing and growing and growing, and the board game industry will die of it. Mm -hmm. Did not happen. Because... Well, see, I, I've, I heard about people talking about uh, in the beginning of the computer games, it was great because they sit together on the computer with split screens playing their computer games because they sat together. And now they say, the new computer games, it's not possible anymore. They're all internet connected, so we are not meeting each other. But the people want to meet each other. They're so they want scary. to sit each other, so they will. T maybe they. Maybe we have these tables where interactive tablet tables to play a game on it. But on the other hand, there will be these still these things where you uh, whatever sit in a campfire outside and you don't want to be interacted. Uh, you want to be connected to some somewhere else, and you want to have. Yeah, this pack of cards. But the computer screen is getting into the game. In Detective, you do some research on the computer. It enters the game. Yes, uh, for, for, for sure, some of the games will use apps, will use uh, websites. Uh, designers are trying to find some new ways to attract ca customers, attract players, uh, get them more immersed into the game. So with the Detective, we managed to pull it over. It's, it's very... Uh, nice for us to see reviews that say this uh, website actually is improving the gameplay because this is why we are doing website. We are doing it to gameplay being better and not to distract uh, <laughs> players. And uh, reviewers are confirming and of course feedback from the players desk as well that we are playing the board game, we are having this wine if you are playing in France, we are having cards, we are having board. And uh, this website is just improving the gameplay, but this is social experience as yes, you are playing all together at the table and the website is just pretending that you are just logging to FBI and checking some data and this is very exciting. So probably Germany and the world will be playing Azul for a very long time. You hope so? Yes, I of hope course. so. Yes. And after that? So does Mr. Kisling, I'm sure. Yes, after that, is it um, Azul 5, 6, 7, 8? No, 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 no. There will be more next move games, there will be more plan B games, there will be more Agatspieler games. But when I say more, I also mean less because our, uh, our uh, yearly planning is uh, two games per year, per brand. Um, I want to keep it that way. I think that the, I call it the spray and pray um, Approach. Technique approach is uh, you spray as many games as you can and pray that one will work. I think that in the f in the long term this is not a this is not good for the market. This is not good for the players, and I think that the the we will keep playing because it's a human need. 
we, st we are children and we play, then they put us into school and tell us we shouldn't play anymore but learn to count and write. And then it comes back to you and you, you have the need to play and you come back and I think we will always play because it's a human need. But um, it is my hope that, not that we play less, but that we pl that are maybe there, um, there's more, less of the spray and pray, but that we play the games um, um, less but better is what I wanted to say. So it's quality over quantity. I think so, yes. For any industry, uh, I think it's uh, it's the best, and we have seen uh, uh, we have seen this uh, phenomenon in uh, comics, for example, in the in the past, uh, in books and everything. And I think it's a normal uh, life curve, but I think in the end it serves better to have less but better. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for the audience to be here and listen to our thoughts. Sophie Gravel. Thank you. Ignacy Cevicek. Friedemann Friese. Carol Rupp. Eric M. Lang. And Stephen Bonacore, thank you so much. <laughs>